أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back to Ramadan Reflections today being the 14th day of the blessed month of Ramadan that means we're almost at the halfway mark of this blessed month 14 days 14 nights and we only have about another 14 to 15 days and nights give or take to engage in fervent worship worship of God and praying and reading the Quran in connection to our Creator. We continue where we were left off from yesterday. You know, the Mi'raj which we spoke about was without a doubt the most amazing gift which Allah could have granted His Prophet. And it came, as we mentioned yesterday, at a critical juncture in his life, being in an economic, political, social boycott, embargo, isolation, Losing his beloved uncle Abu Talib, peace be upon him. Losing his beloved wife, Ummul Mu'mineen, Khadija bint Khawalid, peace be upon her. All of those insurmountable challenges on the shoulders of the Prophet. And Allah opens up an avenue for the Prophet which he perhaps would never have imagined. The journey to the heavens, to the secrets of the creation of God. Now as we said that the Muslims had been expelled from Mecca an economic blockade, a social boycott had been leveled against them. Due to those harsh conditions, the Muslims suffered and the health of the Muslims suffered. In such tumultuous times, you know, a, a, a definite difficult period for the Prophet. You know, we reflect on the beginning of his life where he loses his father, his mother, his grandfather. Now he loses his uncle as well as his wife, things were not looking good for the Muslim community actually. If you look at it from a, a material perspective. And that's where the Mi'raj came in. And Allah showed his messenger the greatest signs of God in the earth and in the heavens. And in the realms which he could never imagine and which the society could never even fathom. Now as we said that there were many things which transpired on the Mi'raj. Some of them we mentioned in our discussion yesterday and much of which we did not talk about obviously because of time constraints. But there were a lot of discussions that went on between Allah and the, Allah and the Prophet. There's a beautiful hadith of Mi'raj which highlights some of the discussions. There are many things the Prophet was given to see, people to meet, things to do, places to go. But there are two prime gifts that Allah gave the Messenger of Allah which we want to reflect upon in the verse under review for today. One is the night prayer, the Salatul Layl, what we call the Namaz Shab. And the next thing is maqam maqam mahmud Now let me first read the verse of the Quran from chapter number 17, Surah Bani Israel, verse number 79, in which Allah says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَحَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةَ اللَّكْ أَسَاءَ أَنْ يَبْأَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودَ And in some part of the night, rise for sleep and observe vigil therein through prayer and recital of the Qur'an, as additional worship for you. Perhaps your Lord may well raise you to a glorious, praised station. Now this verse comes to the Messenger of Allah and grants him, or speaks about two things that he is granted. The first is what is known as the nafila of the layl, the night prayer. As I said, it's referred to as Salatul layl also called namaz al-shab in the language of people of the subcontinent and other regions. And this became a unique prayer of 11 rakat, which are performed after Isha, but before the Fajr. So usually, ideally, sometime in the middle of the night. Now this was given as a gift to the Prophet, not a burden. You know, prayers, brothers and sisters, we should never look at salat or fasting or hajj or khums or zakat or any of the obligations as burdens or... Uh, uh, difficulties. No, these are all opportunities actually to thank God, to connect to God, to become better human beings, better believers. How do you perform the Salat layl the night vigil? Well, I'm not going to go into the details, but it's a very simple uh, prayer to perform. It takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes, depending on your uh, focus and connectivity and how much of it you perform, because you can uh, do the minimum of one rakat, or then, minimum, or then from there to three, or the maximum, eleven. But you can find more details, for example, on www.duaz.org, and also www.alislam.org. And I'll leave 
links in the description of this video to actual step-by-step uh, -step procedures of how to perform the night vigil. Anyways, this, was a highly, this is a highly recommended prayer for all Muslims. However, when it comes to the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah bless him and his family, it was actually an obligatory prayer. He had to perform it every night. There was no option of not performing it. And there are multiple hadith that mention this, that it was an obligation on the Messenger of Allah. Indeed, if we study the prayer from the Quranic perspective and we see the hadith which speak about the merits and the worth of it, we would see what station that we as, as believers can get to through the night vigil. And if those hadith give us the station that we can get to by performing this night prayer, we can only imagine the, sta the station that the Prophet got through his connectivity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the second thing given to the beloved Prophet Muhammad, may Allah bless him and his family, was what Allah refers to as maqam Mahmud. This elevated, lofty, praiseworthy station or status. But what exactly is maqam Mahmud? Because Allah doesn't speak about it in the Quran anywhere. Allah uses it in this verse of chapter 17, Surah al Surah al Rather, Surah Bani Israel, but he doesn't explain it in the next verse that Maqam Mahmud is this, this, and this. It's not in the Quran. And so scholars have obviously had to refer to hadith. And thankfully, people had asked the Prophet and the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, what is Maqam Mahmud that the Prophet was given? It's a general term, first of all. And as scholars of Tafsir of the Quran note, that it can refer to anything a person attains through their own spiritual efforts that Allah will confer upon them. But it's definitely something highly prized, it's something highly cherished, it's something that people should seek and should be sought uh, after. However, in Islamic parlance and in the Quranic vocabulary, th th this term has a specific meaning associated to it. Scholars of the Quran, based upon the hadith, can, are, are, are confirmed to believe that this refers to the Shafa al Kubra, the intercession of the noble Prophet Muhammad. May God bless him and his family on the day of judgment. This is something which is an indisputable reality in Islam, is of intercession. But that topic in its, of itself of intercession is vast. It's not something we can discuss in a few minutes. It's something that will take hours to analyze because there are verses of the Quran which confirm and deny intercession. Obviously, if you don't understand them, they will seem that they confirm and deny, I should say. Because the Quran does not contradict itself. Uh, but there are multiple verses which can be misconstrued as negating intercession of any sort. And you know, there are also multiple ahadith found in the books of tafsir. Such as, for example, the tafsir of Al-Ayashi and others which state that this maqam mahmud was the right for the Prophet to intercede for his ummah. Now, obviously, you know, I'm going to just open up this topic a little bit today, but without the permission of Allah, we know that nobody can stand and intercede for anyone. Not even the prophets of Allah, not even the imams, nobody. Allah is the sole authority. But He does allow in the way that He has created a system, the system, He has allowed certain people that He permits to intercede and their intercession will be accepted. So intercession is a reality only with the permission of God. Intercession is permissible only by whom Allah permits. And if Allah permits a person to intercede, that person has a knowledge of the person who they want to intercede for, and so their intercession will, God willing, will be accepted. You know, when you look at our lives, we try to do our best. We try not to sin. Sometimes it happens. We try to be good human beings, but we sometimes slip, we make mistakes. So we have du'as, we have our salat first and foremost, we have our du'as, we have istighfar, turning to God in repentance and asking forgiveness, we have tawbah, turning to Allah. We have all of these methodologies of seeking amends for our wrong actions. But what if we still are lacking? We don't have enough to get us to Jannah, to paradise. There's still something short that we don't have to make it into the, into, the, into the gardens that God has promised. Well, that is where God has said, Allah has said that He will allow some people to step in and advocate on our behalf. It's not a blank check 
for anyone to sin and live a life of, 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 uh, of evil and debauchery and then say, well, I'm coming on the day of judgment. The prophet, the imams, this and that will come in and intercede for me and I will have no problems. And even if that is the case, what about our time in the grave? Where there is no uh, direct major intercession where we have to suffer the fate of what we have done in the world. And so we understand that intercession that the Prophet was given or that the Imams were given or that even others are given is only by the permission of God. It's not a license to sin or be lazy. It's not a license to run away from responsibility or a green light to do as we wish. Rather, Shafat is actually an intercession to com the complete opposite. Shafat is, is an invitation to being upright, to struggling on the path of truth and justice doing our best to be good human beings. And then if we find on the Day of Judgment that we were somewhere lacking, then we can turn to the people who have been given the right to intercede and ask for their advocacy in the front of Allah. You know, there's a hadith about intercession from the Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family, which is, said, which is quoted as to having, having the Prophet said, that when I stand at the glorious station, I will intercede on behalf of those of my community who have perpetrated grave sins, the major sins. And Allah will accept my intercession for them. However, he says, by Allah, I will not intercede for anyone who hurts my progeny. So intercession is there by the Prophet, as he says, even for those who are major sinners, except if you've hurt the progeny of the Prophet. If you insult and you wage a war, Against the commander of the faithful Imam Ali, your rightful Imam, you've hurt the Prophet. You attack the house of the daughter of the Prophet, Fatima Zahra. You deprive her of her inheritance, you've hurt the Prophet. You've hurt the progeny of the Prophet, so you've hurt the Prophet. You poison his grandson, Imam Hassan. You earn the wrath of the Prophet. You kill his grandson, Hussein, in the plains of Karbala. You have hurt the progeny of the Prophet. You could be the best of Muslims with the closest relationship, the family ties, but they will have no benefit with the intercession of the Prophet because of your hurting the progeny of the Messenger of God. Knowing that the people could not deny the prophethood of the Messenger, they couldn't negate the Quran, they were not able to even deny his miraculous night journey, the Isra and Mi'raj, they heard it right from the lips of Abu Sufyan, what the Prophet himself told them. After all of this, brothers and sisters, they had no choice left but to do away with the Prophet, to kill this man. However, as the Quran confirms time and time again, the people plan and Allah plans and Allah is the best of planners. Rather than letting his Prophet be like a sitting duck waiting to be killed, Allah informs the noble Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family, to leave Mecca and to go where people love and cherish him and look forward to his arrival. This would be that momentous event known as the Hijra, the migration to the city of Yathrib, which would later on be called Medina to Nabi, the city of the Prophet, or Medina for short, the city. God willing, tomorrow on the 15th day of the month of Ramadan to mark the midway point of this blessed month, we will investigate the Hijra, the migration to a new land. Until then, wassalamu alaikum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.